Welcome everyone to the fifth meeting in 2016 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, could I remind everyone present please to switch off your mobile phones and also that no apologies have been received. Item one on the agenda. The first item is the consideration of a statement of reasons in relation to the proposed seatbelts on School Transport Scotland Bill. Before introducing a member's bill, the MSP must first lodge a draft proposal and then a final proposal. The draft proposal must be accompanied either by a consultation document or a statement of reasons why the MSP does not consider the consultation necessary, which is subject to the scrutiny of a committee. Gillian Martin, the member in charge of the bill, proposed bill, has submitted a statement of reasons for the committee's consideration. So according to Standing Order 9, Point 14.6, where a draft proposal is accompanied by a statement of reason, it's referred to the committee. The committee must decide whether it is satisfied with the reasons given by the member for not consulting on the draft proposal. So I welcome uh, Gillian Martin and Brendan Rooney from the Road Safety Policy Officer from Transport Scotland to the committee. And would I invite Gillian Martin to make a brief statement on the bill and its consultation. Yeah, thank you very much. Good morning to everyone. Thank you to the committee members for this opportunity to set out my proposal to legislate for the inclusion of seatbelts in all dedicated school transport. It's my firm belief that the safety of our children and young people is a responsibility that we all share. And as a parent and an MSP representing a rural community, I'm acutely aware of the importance of the journey to and from school can play in those efforts. And that's why I'm bringing forward this bill, which will serve to increase the safety of children across Scotland. Local authorities have certain duties to provide dedicated home to school, uh, school transport for entitled pupils. And whilst it's also regularly seen in the independent school sector, and this is often delivered through contracts with private bus operators, there's currently no legal obligation for seatbelts to be fitted in such transport, despite the well-established safety benefits they can bring in a road traffic accident. These legislative proposals intend to address that. Many councils in Scotland already provide dedicated school transport with seatbelts and ensure it is stipulated as a condition within contracts. I want to build on this good work, making such practice universal so that all pupils on such journeys benefit from this important safeguard. As set out in my statement of reasons before the committee, this issue is some history emanating from considerations by the Public Petitions Committee and with devolution of power being secured by the previous Scottish Government administration last year. Additionally, an extensive consultation was carried out from March to June this year, garnering views from individuals and organisations with an interest in, such as parents, schools, individuals, local authorities and bus companies, and with a comprehensive analysis published just last month. Given how fresh and current this is, it's my view that a further consultation seems unnecessary and would simply duplicate responses from the same respondents on an issue which has not moved on. However, I completely respect that this decision lies with the committee. Alongside this, the Scottish Government also established a working group of key stakeholders specifically on this issue, which has been meeting for the past two years. Extensive dialogue and considerations such as the practical, operational and financial implications has allowed interested parties to help guide and influence those proposals. Indeed, such dis discussions led to the Scottish Government's plan for the legal duty to come into force in 2018 for vehicles transporting primary school children and 2021 for vehicles carrying secondary school pupils. This lead-in time is to give those affected, primarily local authorities and bus operators, time to allow for the changes, particularly in relation to contracts, and it would be my intention, intention to allow for this. I resolve to continue such useful discourse and to carry forward the invaluable feedback from the recent formal consultation to shape the bill before they introduce it to Parliament. Thank you, and I welcome any questions from the committee. Thank you, uh, Gillian. I, th I, I see some questions lining up already. Uh, Stuart's got the, the first question. Uh, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Convener. I hope uh, you, you will not mind if I say it's appropriate to thank Mike Pennon, who is a, 
uh, a minister uh, at Westminster who kicked off the process of uh, making sure that we had the powers uh, to do this if Parliament ultimately chooses to do so. But what I specifically wanted to, to ask uh, Gillian Martin uh, was whether she's been in touch with my constituent, Ron Beattie, uh, whose uh, efforts, I think, on school bus safety are where the genesis of this uh, actually lies. Uh, I know this is not the whole of my of Ron Beatty's interests, uh, but I would certainly hope that uh, the member uh, digs into the collective experience and memory of uh, Ron Beatty in uh, taking this bill forward. Yeah, absolutely. I met with uh, Mr Beatty a couple of weeks ago on this issue. Um, I have to pay tribute to Ron Beatty because um, obviously in, in Aberdeenshire, the local authority of Aberdeenshire Council has already got this uh, dedicated school transport um, seat belts in place and, and other measures, other voluntary measures that they've actually put sc uh, school bus signage on and that is largely due to the efforts of Mr BT campaigning for this. So yeah, he's a very valuable person to speak to in this and he absolutely welcomes this. Thank you. Uh, John, you've got a... Thanks so much. There was a couple of uh, points. Um, I mean, we're using the word transport and I'm assuming we're meaning buses and not dedicated trains because certainly around Glasgow we occasionally have a, a dedicated train for, to take kids to school, and trains do not normally have seatbelts. It's, it's dedicated school bus transport, that is the, the remit of this bill. Okay, and, and my other point was, was there consultation done, or is it purely fitting the seatbelts rather than wearing the seatbelts? Um, because in a car, a child would have to wear a seatbelt. Yeah, the, the reason for that is that the, the laws around the wearing of seatbelts are still reserved. Um, as, as you'll know, that the law stipulates that over 14 it is the law to wear a seatbelt where there's a seatbelt provided. Um, but so beyond that, we can't legislate on that. It's purely the contracting of dedicate of, of, of school buses or buses contracted. The local authority must stipulate that they have seatbelts on. Um, I'll, I'll point to, again, I'll come back to Aberdeenshire Council and how they've managed this. They've been doing this successfully for a number of years. And the, way, the ways in which, of course, they ensure that children actually wear the seatbelts is down to, largely to the schools, the parents, parent groups, education, making children aware that they're there and the safety implications. So it's really been quite a successful exercise in Aberdeenshire that we can point to. Of course, also, members will be aware this was already put forward in the the Welsh uh, government also put this forward as well. Again, um, yeah, it is really a, sort of a, a campaign around awareness of, of the safety of wearing a seatbelt. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, I think you've got a question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, Mr Mason's question was one of mine also about whether the bill was uh, to ensure that they were fitted as opposed to being worn and how that would be... Um, uh, enforced, I guess. Um, my question, therefore, is around um, private bus companies and the feedback that they gave you in the consultation. Were they uh, overly positive or neutral to yeah. it? And, and also, who would bear the cost of the retrofitting of the seatbelts? Yeah. So, uh, as I've mentioned, we've been consulting, but we also have a working group and bus operators have actually been part of that working group and they've been very positive about this. Um, the situation is that, that really most, most buses already have seat belts on them. It's, we're really talking about the ones that are a lot older. I think 15, it was 15 years ago they had to have seat belts on them anyway. So we're really talking as of like the, the older end of, of buses. And you'll notice also that there's a lead-in time for this to happen, and that's come out of our consultation with local authorities and bus companies. So, the, you know, again, 2018 for primary school transport, 2021 for secondary school transport. So it's not happening immediately. It will be a lead-in time as well, and that's come out of our consultation with bus companies and local authorities who've been very supportive. OK, and on the cost side of it? On the cost side of it, the, the costs are still being worked on. The, the costs will be borne by the companies themselves bidding for contracts, um, and that was the way that it was done in Wales as well. OK, Jamie. Just uh, so uh, on new contracts, there for any new tenders that come out for services, will obviously stipulate that they yes. have to have um, seat belts, and therefore bus companies will have to sink that cost to bid for it. But uh, are, will there be within this time period any 
retroactive fitting where bus, private bus companies will have to bear the cost of doing it or will local authorities or the Scottish Government subsidise that in any way? Well, if you look at the timescale for when contracts, it tends to be sort of a five-year period and this is something that's actually obviously been in the wind for, for quite a while. Yeah. I mean, we knew these powers were coming to, to Scotland, so it's not, it's not something that bus companies haven't been aware of. Um, of course, we've been consulting with them. Um, but yes, the, the, the onus will be on the bus companies who are actually bidding for these contracts to fulfil the obligations of the, of the contract. Thank you. Sorry, can I just follow up slightly before we go to somebody else on that? Is, is it won't stop people bidding for contracts if there aren't seatbelts there, but they can put the seatbelts on before that, you know, if they're awarded the contract. Is, is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Brendan Rooney. Really, that's a very niche question, which probably requires Brendan's expertise. Yeah, the, the, the way that school, sort of dedicated school transport is provided in local authority to local authority can vary quite considerably. So it's, it's not a, a very um, sort of black and white picture. So it would depend on things like the level of competition in an area. Obviously, if a local authority goes out to contract, the, the number of bus companies with different vehicles within their fleet will determine whether or not or how easily that can be provided within an area. <coughs> so it's, it's not really there'll be one uniform situation in, that will be replicated across 32 local authorities. It will, it will vary from area to area. Um, obviously, there's already 17 that have, that have done this. So at, um, within some, it can be absorbed within contract costs. Some, it may lead to differences within the contract costs. We have had quite a lot of dialogue with, with bus companies and local authorities on that. Um, we're also doing a, an exercise at the moment with COSLA and the, the Scottish Local Government Partnership to, to better quantify exactly what the cost implications of this will be, because it's not, it's not a, simple, um, a simple exercise in taking a bus in one cost and multiplying it by that. There are other factors within the area which will, which will impact on that. I, I think what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to understand, if, if I may, is that to, to put your seatbelts in buses, if you're not going to award the contract just on the chance that you can bid for the contract, I don't think it would be fair, but providing there was a stipulation that the, the, the seatbelts would have to be fitted before they could be used on the contract, would give um, uh, suppliers or, or, or tenderers uh, some flexibility. I d I'm going to leave that hanging, if I may. I, I think the point is made. Rhoda, I think you had a point there. Can I just ask a couple of supplementaries and then yes. ask what is a process question? Um, or a couple of process questions. And just a supplementary to the questions that were being asked before. Um, the legal situation for young children wearing seat belts is that they also have a booster seat that is um, applicable to their size and weight. Would that also be part of the bill, and who would who would be handing out the booster seats to the right kids at the right time? Well, as Brenda's pointed out, there's already 17 local authorities that are already doing this. So we looked at the, the practice of those uh, schools and those, those bus companies that are doing that. But at the moment, it is this, um, it, it really is varies across those local authorities. But you're right. In some cases, there's booster seats. In some cases, there's modified seat belts. This bill is specifically about providing seat belts on those buses. So the other arrangements around booster seats aren't included in the bill. Really, that's just going to be a case of how the, the, the various schools and school buses actually, you know, uh, provide those extra safety mechanisms. But that's been working very successful in a range of, of primary schools and nurseries up and down the country so far. So, um, so it's not going to be stipulated as such the use of booster seats, but that obviously that's something that, that, that's uh, already done in order to make children safe. Um, as, and a lot of the bus companies um, are involved in that already, um, providing those extra safety mechanisms. But ours is specifically about dedicated school transport having the seat belts. Okay. Um, can I ask a couple of process questions? Um, given that you're using the consultation that was carried out by the government, is there anything that you're proposing as part of your bill that hasn't been consulted on or something that was consulted on that you are not including in your bill? No, it is very, it, it is this very, very simple um, mechanism for local authorities to stipulate that buses that are used for dedicated school transport must have seat belts. 
um, and that is the premise on which we put the consultation out <coughs> and that is the premise on which we're still working with the working group to take the bill forward. There's nothing, there's nothing been added to that, there's nothing been taken away from what was consulted on. Okay. And my other question is, I mean, we're all aware that the government can take over members' legislation. I think this is maybe the first time that a member has taken over government legislation. Um, I'm, I'm wondering what the process for that is and whether that will prevent another member taking forward members' legislation. Um, you know, government obviously have time to take forward their own bills. I, would, I wouldn't like to see a government bill kind of circumventing the processes in the Parliament that went, might stop a member taking forward their own legislation. I'm just going to jump in slightly there, Rhoda. I, I, I think it's a point, a point that you've made. I'm not sure that that's a question specifically on the consultation that is fair to ask, and, and it's something that we can take up perhaps after the committee meeting. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to just curtail you on that. Do you have another question nope, that you'd like to ask? Questions. Uh, Mike. The only question in front of the committee today is, is whether um, we should agree that you don't need a consultation. Uh, that's the question facing us. So my question really is based on that. It's a simple one, very, very simple. Are you aware of anybody or any organisation who feels that they haven't had the opportunity to um, contribute to the formulation of your bill or, or the consultation process? Is there anybody out there who would feel aggrieved if we allowed you to just no. proceed? We're, we're fairly confident that we, we had 76 respondents and they came from a wide range of, mm -hmm. of groups. But of course, we're still also working. This working group is still going on as well. Mm -hmm. So there's an opportunity for anything else that comes up to, right. be, to be taken into account. But as, you, as you'll know, the, the consultation um, was only published in well, August mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. So really we have been working up until that point. Um, we feel it's been very wide ranging. I can, of course, provide the committee with a list of the people who were involved in that mm -hmm. consultation. Mm -hmm. There are links in the statement of reasons to, to the results of that consultation uh, that you can actually look for yourself and see who's there's involved. No, there's nobody banging on the door, as it were, saying we went we want to be consulted and haven't been able to. No, no, yeah. we've, we've, we've looked at, um, we've, we've consulted with local authorities, COSLA as, as, uh, um, as well as the local government partnership, um, school groups, parent groups, bus companies, mm -hmm. um, road safety uh, groups as well. So we, we feel, it, feel it's been quite comprehensive. Thank you, nice one. Are there any other questions? Um, okay, so I, I before we, I go on and ask if there's formally um, whether the members are satisfied with the reason, Jill, and I think there's some interesting points that have been brought up today uh, in discussions with uh, the committee, and I'd hope that you'd be in a position that when you bring the bill forward that you can take into account some of the points that have been raised by the committee, because I think it's done in the hope of, of, of making something worthwhile. So. What I'd like, I need to formally do is ask the members if they're satisfied by the statement of reasons uh, that Gillian has given. Yes. So that just leaves me to thank you, Gillian and Brendan, for coming to the, uh, the meeting today. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. I'm just going to suspend the meeting <coughs> briefly to allow Gillian and Brendan to leave. Okay, La ladies and gentlemen, the, the second agenda item is the consider consideration of three negative instruments as detailed on the agenda. This is a packet of instruments which will be introduced a decriminalised parking regime within the Highland Council area. And at that moment, I'd like to just pause and ask members of the committee if anyone has an interest to declare in relation to this. Uh, Deputy Convener. Um, yes, I have an interest. I am a Highland councillor um, and therefore will take no part in the discussion or in the decision. Thank you. Does anyone else have an interest to declare? Okay, so the 
the committee will consider any issues that it wishes to raise in relation to the reporting to the Parliament on these instruments. The member should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. So I'd like to invite comments from the members if there are any on these. Uh, oh, they're queuing up. R Richard. I have a particular question on page 8, um, section, think, section 5, but on to section 74, substitute. Fixing of certain parking and other charges for parking area shall be the duty of the parking authority to set levels of additional parking charges to apply in the parking area. Different levels may be set for different parts of the parking area. So you, you could have that you're only paying 50 pence in one bit and paying a pound in another bit. And, and I think that's uh, quite, quite outrageous if that's in this, that different levels of parking charges can be set in the parking area. I would like someone to explain it to me. Uh, Richard, uh, I can always guarantee on you to ask a difficult question, but I, I think my understanding of the legislation is such that the aim is to give the councils the flexibility to charge different uh, uh, rates in different areas. I don't think it's different rates within different car parks. I, th I think even that the Highland Council would, would find that difficult. Um, so I, I, I take your point. I think you're delving into uh, exact spots. Sorry, Stuart. Um, it can be just if it's helpful as a single example of where this has already been implemented. I, I speak to the Aberdeenshire Council's car park in Inverurie, uh, which is adjacent to Marks and Spencers behind the railway station. Half of the parking is free to provide overflow parking uh, for the railway station, and the other half is chargeable on the basis that people are visiting Marks and Spencers. It works perfectly well. It is a single car park with different charges and different bits. It seems to work perfectly well. I speak. I do not speak to how Highland might or might not use this power. I merely make members aware that it is working, I think, satisfactorily in at least one place in Scotland. I think the Highland Council um, will be scrutinised quite heavily on, on, on this, so I, I'm trusting them absolutely on this. Sorry, I should have come to, to Mike first, because you were... You were. Uh, um, my question really is about the policy objectives and the background and the policy note that's been provided. So if I refer to the policy note, Annex B, and uh, page 25. And it says on paragraph four, to date, 14 Scottish local authorities have introduced decriminalised parking enforcement. Under these arrangements, local authorities administer their own parking penalty schemes and retain the penalties and retain the penalties collected to finance parking enforcement procedures. And then it goes on to say in paragraph six, any surplus is used to improve off-street parking facilities and for traffic management purposes. Therefore, the revenue is effectively ring-fenced for traffic management measures and cannot be used by an authority for another purpose. But, of course, that doesn't prevent the authority from diverting funds that were to be spent on this field into something else. And really, my question hinges on this. Is there, I'd like to know, and I think the committee should be, we should be aware of this rather than just immediately passing this uh, legislation. What are the consequences of the, uh, what's the experience of the 14 other local authorities having gone through this process? Is there an, uh, is there an experience of an increased number of parking, uh, charges being raised against motorists uh, because it strikes me that giving the local authorities the power to do this um, is fine um, but what about any unintended consequences are we aware of any unintended consequences about this and it's really asking for further information before we approve it that's all I, I think that's a, a very fair point and I think we, we should write as a committee to the government and ask them to, to look into this because actually to say to, to undertake to do something and, and then not do it would be wrong. So I think that's a, that's a very fair point that we could, we could raise with the government and I think the committee should write um, with that question. Okay. Uh, to, would everyone agree to that? I think, I think it's a sensible way forward. Sorry, John. I mean, just for, for information on that point, what happens in practice in Glasgow is they put a lot of work into the city centre where they can make a lot of money out of fines and they scarcely ever bother about parking 
further away from the city centre. So you can park in a double yellow line in my constituency a lot of the time and nothing will happen to you. Uh, that's a bad thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but that is pr in practice is what happens. And I mean, as far as the charges are concerned, I mean, certainly in Glasgow, if the nearer you are to the city centre, you pay a lot more. And, and as you move further away, you pay less. Uh, sorry, can I just come back just to clarify that? I mean, the problem is, is this legislation is, is just to clarify, is, is time limited. So we're going to have to move forward. What is the, what is the important thing is to point this, this concern out to the government and make sure that, it, that uh, as these orders come through, that, that actually it achieves the aim that it's meant to achieve, not just gets frittered away on other schemes. Are we just saying that we're going to have an opportunity to, to, to our next meeting to do this or, or, or not? It, it, it's a process. There is no process to annul, so so no, we so I, we can we have to take them forward, mm -hmm. but we can raise issues with the government. Yeah, right. So really, what I'm flagging up is when the next, if and when the next one comes through, they should have brought this information to us. Yes. Um, I absolutely, well, okay. I'm absolutely convinced there will be another one coming through in, in yeah. the not too distant well, in that case, future, I'm content and, um, and we yeah. will ask the question immediately after this committee meeting. Sorry, John. I think uh, that paragraph that Mike rightly uh, highlights. I mean, we have to have faith in the local authority. This is this is uh, um, been long awaited by them, and, and you know I have every confidence that Highland Council will conduct themselves appropriately. And I think we should just move to pass this legislation. Well, we can't, John. We can't annul it. It, 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 it it's going to go through, uh, as far as I see it. But it's an absolute point that we can raise um, to to them and make make points that we are concerned about it. Sorry, Jamie, and then Stuart. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, without too much repetition, I think uh, rather than, uh, given that we can't stop these coming through, I think uh, the members make a very fair point, and that's uh, around the transparency on the revenues generated on both the parking charges, but also the penalties. Uh, and that's that as we're adding further authorities on to this, um, that, there, that we can look back and see what's happened in the previous 14 that there is proper transparency on where the revenue generated is being spent, um, that it's been spent in the right way, that any surplus is being reinvested in the right way. There doesn't seem to be any proper process of holding uh, people to account in that respect. So uh, I, I think it's important that we do write uh, to the Scottish Government and, and ask what measures they're taking to regulate and oversee that transparency before we, before we blindly keep adding authorities on. John. And I think we're getting a wee bit carried away with I, ourselves I think, here, I, I um, think, I, convener. I, I, this, 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 this committee, uh, uh, best of luck with anyone interrogating local authority accounts to that level. I, I don't think that's within the, the, the remit well, of this committee. I, 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 I absolutely think that, that, that we, we can rightly ask the question, um, and, and there is another one, I suspect, coming very closely down the track, so we'll push the government for an answer. And we can but report back. I think it's important the committee does get an answer on that. Stuart. Uh, and do forgive me, convener. I just wanted committee members to be quite clear, and perhaps our clerk can advise us on this. Um, this order was signed on the 31st of August, and the parliamentary process is unless a motion to annul. Correct. And it doesn't have to be at this committee. It can be at any point in the parliamentary process is passed before the expiry and do forgive me i can't remember if it's 40 or 42 days uh, so the clerk might remind us of that that it, 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 it is open to any member and continues regardless of our deliberations today to be open to any member it's just important for future reference for you know i recognize many of our yep. colleagues and you would the clerk confirm it's 40 or 42 days it's 40 days right it, i just wanted colleagues to be aware of that it would be a member of the committee that this comes yes, forward that would lay that. And I, I just want to make the government quite clear that I wouldn't want to do this unless I had, uh, but I'm prepared to do this if we don't get the information. I think it's very important that we have well, the information. But you might. Uh, I, I think I've, I've given you an undertaking yeah, you that we're, get, we're going to write. There's not, there's not an ability yeah. to annul this. So, Absolutely. Um, we, we can just take, take that forward. There's not an ability to annul this. Okay. Sorry, there is a. Pre I'm told there is a process for yes. for bringing a motion forward, but yes. no member has brought a motion yes, forward. Yes, right. okay. So we're not in a, a, a position to, an, to to annul this one. Is my understanding? Yes. Okay, it's going just 
Okay. So there's been some comments, uh, and, and there has been a recommendation which we've said that we'll, we'll take take up. Um, so I suggest that uh, that. Uh, is the committee therefore agreed it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments uh, as of today? Yes. Perfect. Thank you. So we'll move on to the ag agenda th item three, which is the committee is invited to consider the draft memorandum of understanding between Ofcom and the UK government, Scottish government and Scottish parliament as outlined in paper three. Again, I would invite comments on this. Uh, John, you said you, you would like to raise some comments. Yeah, yes. Um, I mean, I think probably this is quite a standard format, and I'm guessing that uh, the wording is standard and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think I just... Uh, it, it, it was some of the words uh, that were being used. Um, Ofcom will... Cons so could you just refer us to the... Yes. I'm, I'm, well, I'm looking at the covering paper... Uh, so it's actually the second page of the covering paper, but I think it's quoting from the actual memorandum, which I'm struggling. It's paragraph four. Okay. Uh, is, okay, but is that, is that actually qu quoting from the memorandum? I'm not quite sure. Well, it's the memorandum that, that, that's the critical bit. Yeah, well, I, I realise that. Uh, so these three bullet points, Ofcom will consult, Ofcom will consider, and Ofcom will send. Um, I mean, I just feel that doesn't give a lot of power. Okay, I mean, that's the briefing paper, John. So yes, I'm I just, accept that. I'm just trying to look at the, the specific bit in the memorandum that you're, that's causing concern. Page five, paragraph eight. Paragraph five, Sorry, I'm yes, told, so that's right. Yes, uh, that's the correct place. Yes, yes, that is the correct place. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, the same wording. Uh, it, it doesn't give the Scottish Parliament or Scottish Government a lot of powers if all that Ofcom have to do is consult, consider and then send the plan. So, so I mean, I, th I think that, I accept that that is the case, I just wanted to kind of point that out and highlight it, that uh, we are not in a terribly strong position. And I also wondered in a, the previous page, page four, a paragraph six, <laughs> a, um, bullet point two, exactly what is meant. It says, prior to any appointment, the Scottish Government will be required to consult with the Secretary of State. This will enable the Secretary of State to ensure that the board will function effectively. But if, if the Secretary of State's only been consulted, then I don't think the Secretary of State can ensure anything, I would have thought. I think the government signed this part of the, uh, the, 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 the memorandum off, so they seem to be happy with it oh, and enough. have left co less concerns than, than That's you. Okay. Well, just, I, there was a point that uh, <laughs> jumped out at me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John. Maybe perhaps on a positive note, and also referring to paragraph six, the first bullet point there, I certainly welcome the responsibility for the approval of members of the board of MB MG Alipa um, being the sole responsibility of the Scottish Minister, so I think that's a very positive step. Okay. Uh, Stuart. Um, sorry to be process bound. I'm obviously having one of these days. Um, I, I gather that this is a courtesy that we're being invited to approve it as a committee rather than a legal necessity. Um, it being that this is a, a memorandum of understanding between uh, four parties, of which the Scottish Parliament is one. Um, and uh, it, 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 therefore, our, our deliberations will merely form part of the consideration rather than being binding on anybody. Just to be clear. Yeah, my, my understanding um, is, is that we'll produce a short report on this and then it will go to Parliament to be approved by Parliament. So, 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 so there is an approval process that we yes. contribute. Yeah. That's fine, Convener. I'm sorry, John, I, I didn't formally welcome your welcoming bit on the, on the, on the thing, but thank you. You're welcome. All right, Jamie. Um, first of all, I, I see this as quite a positive move. I think the Smith, Smith Commission has um, rightfully um, recommended this. I, I do notice, though, that in terms of parties involved, it's DCMS, Ofcom itself, the Scottish Government, and then the Scottish Parliament, and I guess it's the Scottish Parliament bit that I'm unsure as to if we're party to this MOU, 
how the parliament itself, as a, as a body, is it through the committee, is it through the chamber, is it through members individually, how do we participate in this MOU as opposed to the Scottish Government ministers in Ofcom? It is part of the process. This is part of the process for it to go in front of the parliament. So it will go in front of the parliament um, to, to be agreed once it's, it's completed. So I guess on, in terms of the ongoing relationship uh, with Ofcom, we, for example, as a committee, will have the ability to invite Ofcom to present evidence. There's no mandate for them to attend. But, but, I, but, but I, sorry, my, my understanding on that is absolutely right for the committee and it will be this committee to ask Off Ofcom to come to the committee and explain how, how it's going. So we, we can actually call them in here and question them on the memorandum of understanding, which I think is actually quite a thing that mm. we should welcome as part of the committee. Sure. Stuart. Uh, can I echo that welcome, but point to bullet point four in paragraph six, we have the power to require that Ofcom appear. So we can invite anybody but now we will be able to require Ofcom to appear, and I think that's a very welcome change. Albeit in practice, I'm sure they would have been willing to come and see us anyway. I, I, I take your play on words. I, I oh, always no, think, I, I always think it, it, it's nice to invite them, even if they are required oh, yes. to attend. Oh, yes. <laughs> of course. Are there any other comments? Okay, so... Uh, are, are members content then to recommend that the Parliament approves the Memorandum of Understanding? Yes. Yes. Thank you. That concludes consideration and we'll report on the outcome of the consideration to the Parliament. Now, at the final uh, item, oh, sorry, agenda item four is the committee is invited to appoint a member to serve as an EU reporter. Now, paragraph four of the paper outlines the role of the EU reporter in addition, paragraph 5 outlines a specific role for the reporter in, re in relation to reporting to the committee on issues that arise from the UK's exit of the EU, which are relevant to the committee's remit. And I'd just like to ask, because I think it's an important role for nominations from members of anyone they think that would be appropriate to take on this role. Could I ask a question first? Yes. How much support is there for someone in this role? Because they cannot possibly do it themselves. No, absolutely uh, important that uh, the clerks will support, support the role because it, it's not something that a member can take on and do themselves. So they will have clerical support and they'll also have uh, access through to me at any time to help as well and to, to work together on it. So yes, there is clerical That's support. Right. Yes. Um, it's my recollection that uh, some committees actually have appointed two, possibly, if you so wish, they were minded. Uh, I'm quite happy with one, and I, I don't intend to be seeking the nomination either. <laughs> I'm a okay. reporter for a health committee. Okay, well, I, 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 I understand your point. I mean, and, and let's see if there's anyone, well, is anyone like to, to nominate somebody? P P Sorry. <coughs> okay, before we nominate, yeah. Yeah, just so in terms of the, the, the way in which this individual uh, liaises with the European External Relations Committee, is that the primary function is to attend sessions of their committee and feedback issues which are relevant to this committee and vice versa? Or is it just the wider, is it, is it to work with the, the Brexit minister, for example, or what is the, it's quite unclear as to what the... The, the, the role is, is, is to work on issues that relate to the, the activities that this committee is undertaking. So there will be specific areas that the committee undertake that that reporter will be asked to look at. And so it's not just to go off um, and, and do whatever they want, it's to actually work and look at things that the committee want looked at in relation to the work that they've got to undertake. So it is very specific uh, role. Sorry, this is before we go to nomination. So, Stuart, uh, okay. So, is it any other comments before I invite nominations? I've tried it twice now. Let's see if we can get it right on the third time. Uh, Peter, would you like to nominate someone? Yes, I would. I would. I think it, uh, Mike Rumbles would be uh, excellent for this role, and I propose that Mike takes it on. Okay. Are there any other nominations, Stuart? Um, I haven't spoken to her, but I'd like to, so I don't know her response. I'd like to nominate Mary Evans, who, who has been, a, I think, a member of the Committee of the Regions and has been involved in European affairs uh, for some time. 
uh, she needs to indicate whether she's willing to accept that, <laughs> which, which I simply don't know. I have to say that unless it's unanimous, then I'm not... Don't wish uh, to no, no, sorry. No, no. I, 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 at the moment, we're just... We're no, no, I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> Mary, do, do you have a comment on that? Um, oh. Yeah, I mean, I don't mind, because uh, I was, had been thinking about it for another committee, and then we, it was another person to get in that, getting that. I mean, I do have an interest in Europe, and as Stuart said, I sat on the, the Council of Europe and have been appointed to the Committee of the Regents as well. So, um, yeah, we'd consider if the, the support's there, but... You know, I'm not wanting to pit myself up against against your mic. No, it's no, something no, that I'm I would only want to move forward if it was unanimous. If if, 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 if there are people that don't have confidence in my in the nomination. No, my, 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 hold on. Let, let's hold on. We're not, we're not, we're not talking about lack of confidence here. We're just, we're just looking at. I mean, there is quite a lot of work involved here, and, and my question to you is, is, I, I believe that the person needs to to be wholeheartedly committed to it and so my question is are, would you be wholeheartedly committed to it? I was appointed to it, yeah of course I would be yeah. Can you know, yes, sorry. I made the point earlier and, and no disrespect to anyone you know, I, I, you know at the end of the day if two people can uh, work together in order to, to go forward with uh, uh, I in the health committee I'm uh, a joint uh, EU reporter with a, a Tory member you know so uh, with the greatest respect, Mr Rumbles, don't take it personal and don't think that we're trying to vote you down or anything because you, you see a conspiracy around every corner. Excuse me. With, with the greatest respect. I'm, I'm, I'm going to come straight in that. I'm sorry. I don't want those sort of conversations no, well, across the table. No, that's the sort of and what, what I would say to you is I'm going to bring this back at the next meeting when we discuss our work programme. And I will discuss and talk to each member of the committee prior to then to, to, to identify a way forward. So I please don't think that it's helpful at the moment to, to continue this conversation. So I'd like to suspend that item. The next item, therefore, I'm going to move on the agenda is, that, uh, is the decision to take business in private. And that's the uh, asking the committee if they'll decide to take into consideration the draft <coughs> work programme and our approach to scrutiny of the draft budget of 2017-18, and it's to approach to review the legislative process for crofting in its private at its next meeting. Are, are we all agreed to that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. That concludes then today the, the committee's business, um, and we'll meet in private to discuss the draft programme and its approach to scrutiny in the draft budget. Um, at the next meeting. So I'd like to close that meeting now and take a short break before we move on to the informal briefing on, on digital connectivity. <laughs>